Hey guys and welcome to a very special video because today we'll be talking to Caitlin from Leopard Geckos London who not only produces amazing looking geckos but she's a very ethical breeder, she does not breed problematic morphs, she provides a high standard of care to her animals and she also holds an animal activities license which we'll get into what that means for her and her animals in a bit. So I guess it's best to start off with how long have you owned leopard geckos and when did you decide to start breeding them? I purchased my first leopard gecko who is a little normal called Rio from a pet shop in late 2014 um, and then a few months later I purchased Squib who is a bell albino from a different shop but it wasn't actually until 2019 when I found Glowworm who is a glow madness tremper albino pos familian from Wabasaur, who was a wonderful breeder based in Portugal, that I realised that breeding leopard geckos was something I was really interested in doing. And it took about a year and a half of research and a few more gecko purchases before I hatched out my first baby gecko, who was a Maxno Eclipse Tremper. It was very fun. How many geckos do you currently have? We currently have about 30 adult leopard geckos. And that includes three Petoni geckos and two Eublepharis angromanus. And at the moment we have about 70 baby geckos growing out, which is where most of the work goes. Okay, so as I mentioned a moment ago, your business, Leopard Geckos London, holds an animal activities license. How does this affect the way you run your business? An animals activities license, or AAL, is essentially just a pet shop license. So in the UK, if you're breeding animals commercially rather than as a hobby, you have to have one. The whole process took a few months and it involved a lot of paperwork and even an inspection of my reptile room to make sure that all the animals were being kept appropriately. The purpose of an AAL is essentially just to make sure that I'm meeting the five welfare needs which we have in the UK. But for me, the main benefit is the amount of planning it had me doing. So I have to have plans for all sorts of disasters like fires, drought, unexpected hospitalisation. And being a slightly anxious person, this actually really helps with a lot of worries I used to have about the what-if scenarios. It also means that I have to run Leopard Geckos London as a business, so I pay tax and most importantly, I have to abide by all of these laws. So what makes a breeder ethical versus unethical? So there are some really obvious markers for an unethical breeder. Breeders who mass produce with no care for correctly labelling genetics or who breed and sell animals with obvious deformities or neurological conditions are the obvious ones. The history of leopard gecko breeding and that of reptiles in general, as far as I have viewed it, um, is that enthusiasts breed or used to breed with absolutely no input from the outside world. So before Instagram, social media stuff, the only people seeing breeder setups were other breeders. And with the rise of social media and, you know, using platforms like Facebook and Instagram to show off your collection, I don't like using that word, but it is what it is, is that this process is kind of changing massively. So I will get comments and feedback from people with all levels of experience. So people who have been breeding leopard geckos for decades, and people who literally don't even know what Leopard Gecko is will give me feedback on my setups. So this shift has pros and it has cons. In general, I think I've seen the overall husbandry improving in the breeder community, which is leading to a much more ethical market overall. I think it's much easier to define an ethical breeder than an unethical one. So to me, an ethical breeder does the following has a specific vision in mind when pairing the animals. So what traits am I trying to reproduce and combine? And what is my long-term goal with this pairing? Health and vitality. So not breeding animals who are clearly unhealthy or poorly bred. So that means avoiding morphs like lemon frost and enigma. Transparency. So am I completely sure that the animals I'm breeding are correctly labeled? And have I done enough test breeding to be 100% sure there's no hidden heads? This is more of one that's a process. So you know, it, you can't just prove out a bunch of hets and you can't test for a bunch of hets in one year. It will take multiple years. But I think as long as you're being transparent with people about what you have and have not done, that's pretty ethical. Husbandry. Can I adequately care for and risk assess the number of hatchlings I'm expecting from this project? And finally, market research. Am I creating something that's adding to the population unnecessarily? Is this more something that already exists en masse? Does the market actually want what I'm producing? I'm sure this is a big question a lot of my viewers have. How can people avoid bad breeders? 
So there's two kinds of bad breeders. There's the kind that doesn't have any geckos at all, basically a scammer. And there's the sort who mislabels and takes absolutely no accountability on the health and well-being of their animals. So the scammers are relatively easy to spot um, if you know what you're looking for. I have a blog post which I wrote a few months ago as my photos along with, you know, people like eco geckos who have a lot of black knights. They just keep being stolen and used to scam people with. People message me being like, oh, is this you? I'm trying to buy this black knight. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't buy that. That's a scam. So I wrote a blog post trying to help people a little bit. But the best thing to do is to ask loads of questions. Any good breeder will be able to tell you about the lineage and the genes of the animal that you're interested in in depth. And they'll also have lots of info on the parents. It never hurts to ask for extra photos and videos of the gecko too. All breeders are absolute leopard gecko nerds at heart, so they generally won't mind sharing their wealth of knowledge as long as you catch them at a good time. The other thing, check reviews. So places like Facebook, Morph Market, they all have review systems which are really great for ensuring that breeders are accountable for the animals that they sell. Which morphs do you believe are unethical? In the UK, the International Herpetological Society has banned the sale of Enigma and Lemon Frost Leopard Geckos at their breeders' meetings. Enigma Leopard Geckos have neurological issues which can drastically affect their quality of life, and the Lemon Frost gene is tied to causing cancerous tumours to pop up continuously on the animal's body. So some people may be wondering, what is the difference between a pet quality and a breeder quality leopard gecko? A breeder quality gecko is one with known genetics and lineage, and a pet quality gecko is one who has unknown genes or some sort of imperfection, which means that it should not be bred from. So sometimes it's really obvious and sometimes it's kind of subjective and it depends on from person to person whether or not they would pet quality an animal. So I bought a black knight in 2020 and she ended up developing skin cancer on her arm as a juvenile. So the vet had to amputate her leg and she's absolutely healthy now, but I do consider her to be pet quality and I don't breed her just in case there was a genetic component. Now, oftentimes female leopard geckos will almost be retired from breeding at a certain age. How long do you plan on or how long would you typically breed a gecko for? So industry standard for this is about five to seven years, as in the gecko will be five to seven years when they retire. After this point, they will stop laying as many eggs and they'll be slower to recover after each season. I actually have one girl who this year, 2022, she's a sweet little vermilion tramper, lovely little girl. She has lost a bunch of weight and even lost some of her muscle mass from producing eggs this year. So I'm definitely going to give her next year off and then I'll decide if she gets retired at the ripe age of four or if I'll try breeding her again. So only time will tell on that one. So it is quite common for breeders to use racks. What constitutes as a good rack setup versus a bad rack setup? So rack setups are something that a lot of pet owners and novice breeders dislike, but they are genuinely the safest way to keep a large number of animals happy and healthy. There is a balance between the space per gecko and keeping up with the amount of turnover that you need in ethical morph breeding. If I use the optimal vivarium setup for every single leopard gecko, I have really struggled to keep up with the cleaning involved, and that would put animals at risk of disease and worse. But then if I reduce the amount of animals I keep to make it manageable, I would no longer be able to keep up with the current market needs and would therefore be breaking one of my earlier guidelines. When keeping a large amount of animals, especially where there's high turnover, so that's geckos coming in and geckos being sold, biosecurity becomes a major player. Quarantining animals properly and ensuring that enclosures are regularly cleaned and disinfected is really important and neither of those would be feasible in vivarium setups. When disinfecting a tub, I can take it outside and use more toxic chemicals such as veterinary disinfectant or even bleach mixes to completely sterilise the tub. But with a 45 kilogram vivarium, I am stuck leaving it where it is and that is going to risk exposing every single animal in that room to the fumes from the disinfectant. So I guess the real question is, how do I make the racks more enriching? So I've been experimenting over the past year or so and I have the privilege of being able to experiment because I have a fairly small amount of animals in comparison to a lot of breeders and so I've added loose substrate to my tub. I've been using the Arcadia Earth Mix Arid substrate and so far I've run into absolutely no issues with this. I also use a lot of cork bark hides and branches to give the geckos adequate climbing room. I also use 50 litre tubs, uh, 33 litre being standard in the UK which is approximately the size of a 20 gallon exoterra in terms of floor space, give or take a few centimetres. It's not perfect and I really hope to one day experiment with overhead heating, UVB and potentially even larger tubs. 
but it's a start. Other readers often really have very good reasons for not doing these things and I really don't judge people for not doing so, but I do believe that the future in breeding husbandry is in more naturalistic rack setups. When it comes to your business, what kind of information do you provide a customer with in regards to a gecko once they've purchased it? And also, how do you ensure the gecko goes to a good home? So as a part of my own obsession with collecting data, I keep really in-depth records on all of my geckos and their lineage. Upon request, anyone who gets one of my babies can have photos of them as they grow up. So they leave at a minimum of 20 grams and a lot of development happens before then photos and information on their parents, genetic and lineage information, and even less solid things like temperament, what they like to eat, which is really useful if they don't eat for a little bit at first, because, you know, if it's a gecko that really likes superworms and you're trying to give it crickets, then, you know, give it a superworm. Because geckos are live animals and not objects, obviously, we always have open lines of communications with prospective homes. So I ask questions and I ensure the buyer has done their research. Uh, we have a care guide with links to all kinds of things that we recommend people buy and we provide people with links to various science-based communities who can help them as well. I also offer lifetime one-on-one -on -one support to anybody who has one of my little ones, as I think it's really important that people feel supported. I think it'd be interesting to look at how you ship geckos in the UK, because I believe it's quite different than what a lot of people do in other countries, like in the US. In the UK, we have a really amazing network of couriers who are all licensed by DEFRA, who can transport animals door to door in a special like heated van, it's very cool. So you pay a fee and your gecko is put onto a monthly run. We are not allowed to ship through FedEx like our US counterparts. And finally, what is your five year plan for your business? Oh, this is a really good question. So one of my favorite projects is my Igni project where I'm trying to create a really strong tangerine gecko with really bold markings, kind of like a fire bold, but I'm not going for the stripe as much. Um, so I'm only on the first generation of this project, but I'm really thrilled with the results so far. I mean, in five years, I really hope to have made some really good progress. In five years, my Eubleferis Angamainu pair will also have both reached maturity. So I will hopefully have some giant leopard gecko subspecies babies. Working with this subspecies has been an absolute dream for me. They're just the prettiest geckos with so much personality and intelligence. It's been my goal for ever, basically, to work with animals full time. And although I'm not quite there, I really think that Leopard Geckos London might be able to at least partially achieve that in the next five years. So, fingers crossed. Well, thank you to Caitlin for this very insightful video. I always like to use my platform for good and finding an ethical breeder who really cares about their animals is fantastic and I'm happy to share Leopard Geckos London with you guys. I will leave all the links below if you want to check them out. But yeah, if you've liked this kind of video, please boop that like button. But thank you for watching and goodbye. <laughs>